depends on what age cover you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's two, and I, I'm guessing, like one of that can be part of maybe that might be the barrier so it's to work in the city. One about balance, which is important. Maybe one about reflection. Yeah, so it might be the answer. Maybe closer, but not mostly. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's hot.
going to get started in just one minute. Do you have both, both handouts? Oh, no. Let's see. Welcome. Great to have you all here. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Marcy Fink Campos and I'm the director of AU Center for Community Engagement and Service. So we have um, a great panel and a lot of visuals and everything is in the PowerPoint. <laughs> she was pens, do not buy these pens. <laughs> um, and I want to um, you know, make sure we make good use of the hour we have. So, how many of you already know the Center for Community Engagement and Service? Okay, that's a large majority. How many people uh, are familiar with sort of community-based learning or, or either practicing it or doing some version of it already? Oh, great, okay. And how many people are here to learn because they think it's something, a direction they want to move in? Okay, so it's kind of a balance of half and half. Of the people who are already utilizing it, anybody want to call out what, what you teach? Yes. Arts management. Oh, right. Others? Teach Washington Yeah, so you might be doing community-based learning without having the CB tacked onto it. That's fine. Anybody who does what they consider service learning in the class or community-based learning? Who else? I know we have more hands than that. Ludi. I'm happy to make study. Okay. In Spanish. Okay, so mm -hmm. you do it in Spanish with, with several classes, right? Yeah. Yeah. I include a little bit of a component to that, and it's not official. Right. You know, it's a CBL. Right. Official life level. Right. It doesn't have to be official. It can be unofficial. Perfect. Anyone else? Anyone else? So our aim this session is to help you kind of better understand what is community-based learning, what it looks like at AU, because every campus has kind of different variations on it and we are very lucky that there's been a huge growth i would say in the past two years more attention to it and more opportunities for people who are teaching to participate and then to hear uh particularly about the cb designation so if your course does not have it and that does appeal to you you know how to go about it because the deadline is somewhere around february 13th so it's kind of mid-year and also to see our office the center for community engagement and service as a resource and Meg Rigo, who's in the back of the room, runs our community service learning program. And she and I work very, very closely with faculty and grad students and students around making this a meaningful experience. And then, of course, the highlight is we have three faculty who uh, you'll hear about their particular experiences. They all are really high quality practitioners. But as you'll find in any course where you're using a um, untraditional pedagogy, there are challenges. So mm -hmm. they'll be able to be you know, pretty honest with you about what are the, the rough spots and what seems to be working well, and of course, why it's working well. We'll just go ahead and do it again this semester. Right? So um, again, I wanna welcome you, glad to have you all here. And basically, our agenda is in the, okay, do we, have, we don't have the clicker. Okay, we're ready to go to the next slide. So <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, we're not clicking today. Our agenda is um, in the second slide, and this is the format we're going to use. So very briefly, I'm going to tell you a little bit about CSLP and CB, and then we'll hear from Easton Law, Jane Palmer, and Kim Yorena about their, their particular courses. And then I'm going to ask them a couple planted questions. And then, of course, it's up to you to kind of take it where you, you want it to go. OK? Sound, sound good? Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. So. Um, and then I'll, I'll share with you some of the resources that we can offer you. Many of them are on the back table, so I strongly encourage you to grab some handouts later on. And we're right around the corner in Mary Grade in 273, so everything you see there you can also either get online or you can get um, from our office directly. Okay. And I also do want to alert you, and you can pick it up later in case I forget to mention it, is the week of January 19th. We have a whole, we're, we're at one of the offices that's organizing a whole Martin Luther King week of events, including a service day on the Monday that's for staff, faculty, and students, when usually about 250 people participate from AU. And then on the 24th, what's totally new is we're doing a teach-in, like a real 1960s teach-in, 
on the whole issue of Ferguson and police brutality and how that translates to the student experience here at American University. So we have some great, great speakers. It's a full day event and I encourage you all to come and also to you, you to encourage your students. So there's some little handouts. Hello. Hey guys. Sorry, Sorry Right on that back chair, you can grab the two handouts. Um, okay. I'm going to have to sit in the back. Because mm -hmm. of you know, you can actually oh. sit in the, anywhere you want. Okay, so next slide, please. So um, community-based learning, anybody, you know, sort of based on your own experience, this is like the formal definition we use, but anybody feel like they want to put it in their own words, what is community-based learning or service learning? Okay, yes. Um, I, uh, a concept that I've been playing with recently is action research. Mm -hmm. So it's um, the process of being situated inside of a group of people however they're defined, mm -hmm. and then utilizing uh, research methods mm -hmm. in order to discover something that would be imme of immediate service to them. Yes. And also that the students would learn in the meantime. Okay. So one subset of community-based <laughs> learning is community-based research, often called participatory action research or action research. And actually, Jane will be speaking quite a bit about that because she's going to be teaching a course on it, and she actually puts that into practice in her class. So that is really important because that concept of collaboration and doing something that's mutually beneficial is critical to also community-based learning. Anybody else want to make a stab at what community-based learning means to you? Yeah. Uh, for me, I always think of turning academic theory into practice. Yes. Uh, just automatically going to the community, helping out with the service that's needed. Right. So it's going to the community, working with the community, uh, finding out what their needs are, and putting whatever you're doing in the classroom into practice, like carrying that theory out by working in collaboration, but also um, the learning is reciprocal. The experience is beneficial for both sides. So that's really, really important. It's not just like standalone service, like you send a student out to feed, feed homeless people or do tutoring. It has to be linked to the content of the course. And that's why we strongly encourage everyone who's doing it to make sure that it's articulated in one of your learning outcomes when you do a syllabus. So they know that like, that's central to the course, it's not an add-on, okay? Great. So the definition is there, and in the second handout is a somewhat longer definition with the eight criteria, which we will keep coming back to. Um, okay, uh, and so what I want to just mention at the bottom is historically at AU, what we have had is something called CSLP. How many people have done the Community Service Learning Program? It's an add-on credit, it's optional. Has anybody done it in their class? Okay, one person. Lou, do you want to just like briefly explain what it is to people? Well, so one of you comes to my classroom at the, end, at the beginning of the semester to explain uh, to students what it means um, and how many hours it involves and it's required mm -hmm. and the requirements. And usually one of them or two just come to your office to talk about it. Right. Uh, at the end of the semester, students have to do something for me, mm -hmm. which I review and then I give an okay on that. So the key, some of the key features of CSLP, thank you, are it's an add-on credit, so it's optional for students, and in four out of the five schools they accept it. School communications doesn't accept it for various reasons. So what? if you're an SLC, you can't do it right now. Come on. And it's only, it's one credit. So if you're teaching a three credit class, what will show up on your grade sheet or roster is an additional one credit. It has to be pass-fail, and it requires at least 40 hours of service, okay? And Meg oversees this program. We go into classes and present on it. You can get a blurb for your syllabus. And basically, in the beginning, there's an orientation, mid-semester, a check-in, and a semester of reflection. And we usually get 50 students each semester who do the CSLP. So we've had that for many, many years. So what changed was this past year, we got uh, something called the CB, community-based course designation. So when students go to register, like now when they go to register, in February or March, whenever they register for next fall's classes, about 20 courses will have a CB next to it. And I'm pretty sure all of you have one now and may have one next fall. They still have to apply, but unless it's a carryover course. Okay, so next slide, please. So these are the eight criteria. I'm not going to spend time uh, reviewing them right now because they will come up in our discussion. But basically, you have to be able to say that you're willing to do these eight things if you're going to receive the CB designation. But Meg and I work closely with faculty to make sure you understand them, you have the tools, and that they can work well. So we, you know, that's one of our aims is to kind of keep plowing ahead with having more CB tacked onto courses. 
why do you think it's better to have a full course be a CB course? And by the way, CB can be, like in Kim's case, a project-based course, or Larry's case, where students work with a nonprofit or several nonprofits and carry out a project, which you'll hear about, or it can be direct service, in which case it must be a minimum of 20 hours. So why is it, why might it be better that we've now instituted this kind of course-wide um, methodology rather than just optional? Yeah. Well, all of the students are engaged in it, so when they come back to the classroom, they're all discussing a shared experience. Exactly. As opposed to the one or two who often mm -hmm. Right. So if one or two do it, other people are going to tune out, and that might mean individual office hours, which, which is fine. But yeah, if it's part of the course, it's core to the course, the message we're sending is this is really a part of your learning experience. What you do in the community enhances and strengthens your classroom learning. So yeah, and we're also happy that now when students graduate on their transcript, it will designate CB. So it's, it's, it's just a good pathway for them to get that community experience. It's definitely good professionally. It, might, it often leads them to internships and careers in nonprofits, which of course we fully support. And um, we're very glad that this sort of has become institutionalized at American University. We just think that that is a recognition that this is valuable rather than this is something you do on the side. Okay, any other comments? Okay, um, I think I've covered the main things I wanted to say. Um, and we will now hear from our three panelists, starting with Easton Law, who's in SIS, and I believe the next slide will tell you who he is. Hi everybody, my name, is, um, my name is Easton. I teach cross-cultural communication over at School of International Service. It's a course that's required for all the undergrads at uh, SIS, so it's, it's a pretty big course. And um, I've been doing a community learning component with it. Uh, started out as like a single project, and then it expanded to something larger and working with the CB. Um, and so I just wanted to share a little bit with you about how I integrated. There's a process to uh, thinking about it, and I wanted to share some of how I processed it. So next slide, please. First, you start with your learning outcome. Right? You, you know what you're teaching. And for me, I had to look at my learning outcomes. This, these are the outcomes for uh, cross-cultural communication. And to think about where does, what is, where does the community learning fit? What, how can community learning actually supplement, strengthen, really align with some of these things? And um, there was a few that really stuck out. Some of them not so much. For example, the first two um, are much more informational. So you know, I didn't think about that as much. When you look at the last one, demonstrate the ability to analyze and interpret multicultural immigrant experiences. I was like, they, they can read about an immigrant experience from any number of articles, or they can actually interact with the immigrant experience. So again, you look at your student learning outcomes, you think about where, what would, how would being out in the community augment the learning experience? There was a sort of, you see the uh, verbal and nonverbal um, communication um, experience, and that, that was really important for them to feel that in a different environment. So, that's the first thing that I would encourage you to start with. Look at your learning outcomes and actually write out how will being in the community supplement these things. So that was the first step that I had to go through. Next slide, please. I think the biggest, one of, one of the designations, uh, one of the requirements for the designations that Marcy had pointed out was the ability to incorporate reflection in your course and, and to be intentional about setting that up throughout the course. So it's not just on the side, but it's really a part of the course. And so for me, that involved very intentional shaping of assignments that would be different than a standard cross-cultural communication course. And I, I felt the tension of both, because I teach a CB section and normal sections. So when I teach those sections side by side, you see the difference. And so some of the things I had to change about assignments included, um, I, I added new readings that specifically had to do with community learning. The CCES has a great library of those readings. Talk to Meg, talk to Marcy. They explore the intricacies about why, you know, why it's important. We've got some text there. So I introduced new readings that other students wouldn't have to read, you know, uh, just to get them prepared. Uh, I had guided community learning journals. And when I say guided, it wasn't this open. You can just write how you feel about your experience. But they had very specific prompts about that try to tie it to the content. Um, then there was um, integration with a key assignment. One of the key assignments I've always had, even if you're not in my um, community phase section is you have to go into a neighborhood and sort of do some like a mini ethnography and see the culture of the neighborhood. So now that assignment is tied to the service learning or the community learning. They have to work with the organization within that neighborhood. So they're doing sort of both sides. And lastly, they needed to do a group presentation with, with the community partners. At the end, I invite community partners in and they do a presentation with them on, or for them about what they've learned so that the community partners actually get to see 
sort of what the students have gained from them. So those were some key changes I, in terms of assignments. So, you know, learning outcomes, then tweaking your assignments to match those outcomes as well. Next slide, please. And so strengths, um, really it's just the glue that, it, it, the service learning, the community learning is like glue that makes the content real. That's just the bottom line. You remember it when you have an experience. That's really what it is. And it, based on my particular learning outcomes, it wasn't about actually what they did. This might be different for your class and you'll see in some of their classes. It was about the relationship they built. A lot of the learning was facilitated around, you know, how did you relate? How, why was it hard to relate? So it was about uh, the relationship and the building of empathy. The challenge, really, really hard, is you, you have to cut content. I had to cut content. And that's the hardest thing for an instructor to do. You cut content, you're just like, oh, I'm gonna talk about this with these other classes, but I can't talk about it with them, because I have to talk about their experiences out in the community. Now, those experiences are really good too, but it's just different and you feel that tension, and that's just gonna be there. Um, varied student experiences. I had students work in different organizations, a total of six, and so some have better ones than others, and that's really hard um, if you're gonna choose different organizations. Um, I wanna show you one very quick example of how uh, students brought all these things together. Yeah. You can turn the PDF file for me. And some students work with um, the Chinatown Service Center, which is operated by the Chinese Community Church down in uh, DC, um, and he's gone to Chinatown, DC, and um, I have a couple. I have slides from their presentation. And I'm just going to show you a little bit about what they did. You know, be done. Hope it comes up. sent me their presentation in PDF file and not in a PowerPoint file. So. Okay, so you have three students, they, they work with the Chinatown Service Center. Next slide. I'm just going to run through this very quickly because they do a good job. First, they talked a little bit about what they did while they were there. So they tutored, they you know, did citizenship test preparation, and this is at the church. So they have a picture of the church in the background. Next slide. Now, again, it's integrated with an assignment about the community as a whole. So then, you know, they go over uh, their experience in Chinatown as a whole, and they compare issues that they've studied in Chinatown in relation to the service center. So there's, so that there's that integration. Next slide. You'll notice that they, you know, this AU there, part of it. And then back in the classroom, they had a section where they talked about course content from readings, and uh, and how that influenced their perception of the, the service learning in the community. And then, next slide. I think that's it actually. Yeah, so I just wanted to show you a good, like this is a very systematic, this is how they integrated it in the presentation. So, thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, next we'll hear from Jane Palmer, and Jane has a bunch of things going on in her neck of the woods in SPA, which includes teaching a, a CB course and also running a new living learning community called Community-Based Research Scholars, which just began this fall. Has anybody heard of that program? Okay, great. So that's something that, you, that we, someone on the board of trustees gave a donation and really wanted that as a kind of a new emphasis for AU. So it's been a very new experience to have a group of students who are dedicated to, to this issue. We're 18 years old. Yes, go for it. Yeah. So, um, Right, well, the PowerPoint is coming up. I'm Jane Palmer. I'm on faculty in the Department of Public Administration and Policy. In my role there, I typically work with master's students, um, but I, uh, so this opportunity presented itself to first, this is actually the evolution to teach an honors program um, that I ended up designating um, as a CB course, which is what I'll talk about first. And then, sort of, people became aware of me, I guess, because of that, and um, somehow, Somebody told somebody that they should talk to me about this <laughs> director of community-based research scholars program. Um, so um, they all kind of came together in the spring. Um, I was I was uh, asked first to teach the community-based research class that I'm teaching this spring, and then when they found out that I'm a former executive director of a nonprofit and I was a social worker for 10 years in nonprofits in Chicago and St. Louis, it, it became um, clear to all of us that I would love to be also the director of this position. So um, I'm, I'm loving it. It's a um, first uh, for incoming first years. Um, we have a group of 30, um, and it's going to be a two-year program, and we're actually doubling the size next year. But I won't get into that at this point. But um, 
So uh, I've already said these things. Um, so for the CB class, the honors colloquium, it was called the Social Construction of Childhood. Um, and this class looked at how public policy and inequality affect, affect a kid's experience of childhood. Um, and I really, it was an interdisciplinary course at 15 honor students, Sam Mendelson's in the front row there, he was one of them, so I, I invited him, if, if any of you have any questions about the student experience and during the Q&A, he's here. And I, I pre-selected four organizations. Safe Shores works with um, survivors of child abuse, child survivors of child abuse. It's a um, child advocacy center in DC. Maya Angelou Public Charter School is in Northeast, um, and it's a charter school whose history, um, originally they started to help kids that had come out of juvie get back into education. Now it's not that focused, but that's the history of the school. The Latino Student Fund, which um, offers tutoring to um, kids at the National Cathedral on Saturday mornings and the National Juvenile Justice Network, which was an advocacy and not a direct service. So I wanted to have a mix, three direct service, one advocacy depending on the comfort level of the student and the availability of the student. One that was really close by at the National Cathedral and others that could take up to 45 minutes to an hour to get there. So that students can kind of work within their comfort zone since this was, I was asking a lot of them to do this outside of the classroom. So briefly at Safe Shores, four students selected this option. They had to go, actually, Safe Shores, we had a more intensive background check, as you might expect, since working with survivors of child abuse. Um, so the four students had to interview. They also had to dedicate three hours a week instead of the, the 20 hours. So they ended up doing more like 30, 30 something hours each. Um, and that was, the, they knew that going in, that that's what that, that site expected. So total, they did 136 hours. And then at each site, I asked them to talk to their supervisor, what final product is sustainable product does that site need from you or want? And the three of them came up with the idea of, of creating a referral manual for the clients um, because they didn't have a really good setup. And so this is some screenshots of their manual. On the left, you'll see their um, table of contents. On the right, you'll see a, 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 what an entry looks like. And it's a, it's a really sizable manual um, and um, will be really helpful to the clients. The second group, there's five students that work with Maya Angelou Public Charter School. They have a residential program. It's not for kids that are wards of the state. It's for kids that have some distractions at home. They come Sunday night, they leave Friday morning, they go home for the weekend, but they live in a, um, in a home with adults and other students where they can have study time. And so they did some college prep workshops with the kids in the home. Um, and they did 107 direct service hours. And their final project was um, uh, uh, and the, an idea of one of the high school administrators, the game of life, but for college. And so um, this is the group, this is a mixed group. So this is um, both the honor students, my master's of, of public policy, child and family policy student, actually Alexandra is, is, is one of those right, right there. Um, <laughs> and the high school students all together, we did a, a mock, mock class, we brought them to school, and we did a mock class with them of what college looks like. And we did a debate about the age requirement when you can drop out of school and with those three groups of people. And this is their game of life that they made and um, some of the, the activities they did and that's something they're leaving behind for the school along with other, um, they help them with personal statements and that sort of thing. Latino Student Fund, there was five students that um, tutored students through that um, organization. They did 111 direct service hours and they ended up creating a, several lesson plans um, of how to, they both facilitated book clubs and they created lesson plans that they're leaving behind for future tutors to use um, on different books for different age groups. They're all sort of assigned to different age groups and to different students they were working with. And so um, multiple, um, they, and then they each did multiple lesson plans. And that was by request of the program administrator. The last student uh, worked with the National Criminal Justice Network. She had less time for direct service. Um, and so I ended up doing a project-based um, uh, uh, community-based learning. Um, she, um, did 20 hours and she did some data analysis for them. They had some program evaluation data from an institute they ran that they just never looked at. So she analyzed it and let them know what the, what the data said. Um, and I can talk later during Q&A if you're interested in how I set up those relationships and how I found those different sites and, um, and developed that. Briefly, I'm gonna talk about the Community-Based Research Scholar Spring Course. Um, <coughs> We have a great partnership with UPO, actually helped facilitate by Megan Marcy. I went to them and I was like, I need an organization that, can, that could use up to 60 at the time, up to 60 undergrads to do research. Because the donor wanted it to be one community partner. And I was, 
who could absorb, I used to, I mean, the nonprofit I ran, we had like five staff on a good day. And so I just couldn't imagine, you know, 60 students being like, how can we help? So this ended up working out perfectly. Um, uh, UPO has been in, in, in DC for, since the 1960s. They're an incredible agency, community action agency, and they do a community needs assessment. And so our students will be collaborating with UPO to go out in all eight wards and interview and survey people and doing focus groups about community needs. And so the students will experience different wards and UPO will get assistance with doing this pretty sizable research project and they'll learn about community-based research and community-based participatory research through that process. And uh, that's all I have for now. It was my brief introduction, but we'll have time for questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much. Jane. Okay, now we're going to hear from Kim Urena, who's uh, school communication, <coughs> oversees all the visual literacy faculty because she's such an excellent practitioner. <laughs> um, hello, Larry. Um, <laughs> hello, that I, my that boss. I, that I oversee <laughs> here. She's my boss. Um, for the year. Did <laughs> <laughs> I not describe it pretty closely? <laughs> oversee is the good word. Yes, you so I'm Kim, and I, yes, I'm term faculty this year in the School of Communication, um, and I exclusively this year teach visual literacy, which means over the year I, I will have taught by May six visual literacy oh. sections. Whoa. Yeah. Dear God. Um, luckily, they're a little smaller this semester coming up. Um, visual literacy, just briefly, is a 100 level um, class in the School of Communications. It's required by some of the um, School of Communications majors. Um, not all of them, and then a lot of students take it as general education credit. Um, and it's basically a survey course of um, exactly what it sounds like, visual literacy, learning how to read um, and interpret and then create effective um, and meaningful visual images. And we do that through three specific units in the class. We use um, graphic design, photography, and video um, as a way to teach students about seeing and creating visual things. So it actually um, dovetails really perfectly by the end of the course um, in terms of incorporating community-based learning into the class because I think we do it in this really unique way where we bring in a client, a nonprofit community partner, and we call them a client and treat them as such. And we have the students work um, throughout the semester, sort of less in the beginning of the semester, more towards the end of the semester, although all faculty sort of teach it differently. Um, towards building towards their final project, which is after they've learned all these great things about design and photography and video, and they've picked up a camera and they've made short videos, um, and they feel comfortable with the sort of technical skills and the concepts of, of visual literacy, they create things for a client, for a real world non nonprofit community partner who has um, a significant amount of visual uh, needs. So we create marketing materials for them. Um, so I'd like to just show you some of the examples actually that my students have created over the past few semesters. Um, so we have, and these are all, and some of these, like, I just, real quick for my students, like some of these are freshmen, and some of these are like general education students that hadn't, like, I, I think that the, the designing for the nonprofit community partner really um, motivated them to create something very strong visually where it wasn't just like they were completing something for a final project. And I think visual literacy faculty will back me up on that, that it really helps them get out of the AE bubble and have somebody real to design something for. Um, so this was a poster um, in my first semester a student created for um, our client, A Wider Circle, which was um, a, a nonprofit dedicated to helping um, vulnerable and homeless populations by um, direct donations of mattresses and beds and furniture and clothing, but they also um, were organizing a national conference on ending poverty. And so they needed the promotional materials for that conference um, to be designed. And this is this comes in um, really handy for nonprofits, um, this particular course, because I worked for a nonprofit as well for, for three years, and I know that the last thing we had room for in our budget was graphic design. It was visual stuff, so we would hire interns or we would hire, hire volunteers, and they would cycle in and out of our three-person staff, um, getting paid or not paid, um, and, and we didn't have somebody permanent on staff. So actually, these sort of project-based things, like designing something for a conference, it was a whole marketing campaign, but I'm only showing you one poster, um, was very helpful for them. So this was one girl in a group. She designed the poster. 
Another student designed the Save the Date card. Other students designed um, day of the event signage so that um, the idea was so that all of them would look the same. They would all have the same brand, the same colors, the same font, the same layout. This was uh, my next client was Casa Ruby, which is a LGBTQ um, safe house and um, uh, center um, for uh, LGBTQ population in DC. And this student actually conceived of this himself, um, of designing a poster campaign um, for ending transphobia um, and directing people to Casa Ruby for resources on learning about um, transgender um, issues and resources um, for use within the community. So this is these are two posters that he designed, one right after the other. Next one. Um, and then this semester I had three different clients to juggle with my three different classes and one of them was the DC International School. Um, it's their first year in operation, um, and they are an international charter school in the city. So because it was their first year, they had um, a lot of visual needs, and a lot of those visual needs were photography. They needed great, um, dynamic, high-resolution, um, well-edited images to use on their website and to put on flyers and to promote. Um, they're looking to raise $40 million to like move into their new space and expand their um, staff and their programming. and so. They needed promotional materials to give to potential funders that really showed the energy of that of the DC International School, even though they're in this sort of temporary space right now in Columbia Heights. So I had six students who were really interested in photography, went on many different days and photographed the students, and they sort of got lucky because these students were just like, take my picture, take my picture. And they were like so into it, and they like they would ask the, the teacher the next day, like, where's the pretty girl who was taking our picture? Or where's the cute boy who was taking our picture? It was very cute, the story letter. Um, so the students were really willing to have their pictures taken. Um, and so they got pictures like this, were more candid um, images of teachers in the classroom. And uh, next slide. To more intimate portraits of the students, which I thought this one was just really great. I mean, she, she's happy. Um, she's, you know, She's a student you would want to use on your promotional. Program. <laughs> 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 if you can the next slide, um, this is like I, I forget the exact um, superlative, but it's one of the most, if not the most, diverse school in um, charter school in uh, the DC area. Um, so in all of their photos, they wanted to highlight that, and it's also a trilingual school. So the students are learning um, English, Spanish, uh, aside from English, Spanish, French, and Chinese at different levels. Um, so they have, if you go to the next slide, um, this was a really great grid where the student decided to focus on um, intimate portraits of the students that could then be used on a number of different materials, but then she took it one step further and created, I think, this really beautiful grid that could be highlighted on the front of their brochure, or, and they're all standing in front of this map that she carried throughout this like vinyl cut on the wall of the school, um, highlighting its internationality. And I think that makes the last one. Yeah, this oh, there's one more. Um, and this is the Community Craft Collective, an initiative of Luther Place Memorial Church, and they needed um, something as basic as a front and back side uh, one pager to get um, the community in interested and get them information about um, this craft collective that was primarily com comprised of um, homeless and vulnerable, um, homeless or, or women um, exiting homelessness. Who have a craft collective where they make um, beaded uh, things and woven things and, and all sorts of different crafts, and then they sell them and promote them within the community. Great. Okay. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> so I'm going to throw out a couple questions, but you all should be thinking about what you would like to also ask our panelists. So one of the things that we hear from faculty a lot is, wow. Like, how do you find your community partners? Do you let students go and look them up or find them themselves, which might take a lot of time, or do you contact them in advance, and if so, how do you make it work? So any or all of you want to comment, say a few sentences about, about how you go about it? Um, very quickly, for me, it was very much a relational network type thing. Um, I'm already involved in the city, a couple of concerns that I really care about. And so it was simply 
reaching out to friends that work in those areas saying, I have some students, you know, let's talk about if this could work. So it was very simple at that level. I actually had a run in this semester because I had an increase in the number of students in the class, so I had to find a partner really last minute. Mm -hmm. And so then th that just shows like you need strong relational ties. Um, and but um, the, as one thing I'd like to mention is as this cohort of community based faculty are is growing, we're starting to swap nodes. It's becoming much more of a community amongst ourselves as well. And there were Meg is working on technology that makes it easier. Mm -hmm. So there's there's ways there's lots of ways to reach out and connect with um, the community. Okay, thanks. Yeah, mine was kind of mixed. Um, for Maya Angelou, um, I had a friend that worked there, and so that was definitely through my social network. When I first realized I was going to be doing this, I sent an, an, a mass email to anyone I could think of, right, and say, yeah. hey, these are the things I'm doing. I talked about the CDL class and the CDRS. Do you guys know anybody? Send them my way. And so I, mm -hmm. I, I started that, and that, that's something that I run into people, and they're like, you still doing that? I think I have an idea. So it's just sort of getting the word out in your social network. Um, so Maya Angelou came from my social network. Um, NJJN, the Juvenile Justice Agency, came from a colleague in my department. Um, the master students do a, pra do a, poly a practicum and they've used them in the past. Um, Safe Shores, I just emailed, like the end of the, it was the end of the summer and I emailed them out of the blue. I used to work with survivors of abuse and kind of threw that in there and I said, you know, this would be really, this would be really, go really well with my class and they were, they were really open to it. Um, and with Latino Students Fund, I think Meg um, connected me with, with them. So I kind of used a lot of different you know, it's a lot of sort of phone calls and conversations and just figuring out what makes the most sense. UPO is also through CSS. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I do want to say briefly before I forget is that because they were with children, they all needed background checks. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I'm a, I'm a kind of obsessive planner person, mm -hmm. and so I wanted to make sure my students knew that, and so I think I emailed you guys. You guys were probably like, oh my god, I don't want to hear my professor, it's still August, but you know, mid-August and said, I, I did a survey and I said, what are your top choices? This is what this will require. This is what this will require. This is how far you'll have to travel. Like so, they knew what they were signing up for before they even met me, and they let me know they all got their first choice. I don't know if you knew that, but they all got their first choice, and um, I sent them. The, I got the background check form. I sent it to them so that that stuff was taken care of almost before the class started, if not the, the second week of class. And that's a great approach because if you start once the school year begins, sometimes it takes longer than you think. Not always, yeah. but sometimes. And this ended up going really smoothly, but there, you know, there could have been yeah. some involved. But we can help with that. So I'll give you a, or a, a negative example because you know we're not all perfect. Um, the, the children, <laughs> the, the, working with kids is definitely very important. I had two students that were caught up in background checks and there was paperwork to stay, and they didn't get to start until very, very late, which completely destroyed the hour element required. The only that way that we get around that was I had to give them incompletes understandably and they because they really want to do it so they're doing it this upcoming semester and turning it in some of the journal entries based on that but that's sort of like the worst case scenario. yeah and that happens and that some happens. of the CBRS students so, as well so yeah. the yeah. Tim did you want to add anything I <laughs> utilize Marcy and Meg um, especially my first semester teaching here I was an adjunct and I went right to them and I was like give me some nonprofits who need some visual work because yeah. I didn't have a network in DC that yeah. worked extremely well for me. so what all of them did was set up in advance the partners. That's not always the strategy we use. Uh, Meg, would you do me a favor and just hold up the Latino um, list? I think purple. So we have a bunch of, di oh, pink, sorry. I just grabbed one. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, we have a bunch of directories, housing and homelessness, health, um, Latinos, race and culture, um, HIV and AIDS, education and use. We have like 16 different lists. They're all up on our website. Sometimes it, it might make sense, depending on your class, for your students to either form groups or individually outreach to organizations. So we have made it easy for them to find, read about an organization that in general we know, not 100%, and give them an email and a contact and they reach out. So I teach a course once a year called the Latino Community of the DC Metropolitan Area in American Studies. And my, my Latino list has immigration, education, seniors, and health, and maybe one other. And so I say, depending on the issue you're interested in and what you might want to write your final research paper on, work in a site that addresses that issue, and they have to do the outreach. I've got 18 students, <laughs> usually the majority make it work. There's always a couple slow ones, and then I have to get on the phone and find them a place. That just is inevitable. It's not 100%, but it works fairly well, and that way they're both doing that outreach, and they're figuring out what is the issue they want to be involved in. And then, based on what they pick, they form groups, and they do presentations together. Meg? 
You know, one of the things we're really transitioning to, because what we find with the, I can put this on the screen later, with the directories was that um, they have a lot of organizations and they're not always an organization that needs a volunteer that particular semester. So we've just launched um, our engagement opportunity list, which you can get to right from our website. Um, and through this, our nonprofits, so if you know nonprofits that want to share opportunities with AU students, it's really easy if they go to our website, there's a whole direction packet on how to post an opportunity and what to do. But here we have, I think so far, like 40 different opportunities that students can get involved in. They can um, look at them. You can scroll through them by like educational opportunities, Latino opportunities. So it is essentially a newer updated version of these directories and that anything that's on here is something that a nonprofit is currently seeking. And they have directions when you click on them of how to get in touch with that organization if it's an application or whatever, whatever it happens to be that they need to do. Great. Yes. Yeah, uh, could you guys talk about how you handle expectations in terms of relationship with the community? I worked for several years in Philadelphia for the University Community Collaborative. Yeah. So a lot of it was with farmer firms, a lot of it was project based, but there was always, and sometimes a project was involved in another project, another project with different teams of students. But uh, many times the, the problem was with the communities that we were working with would expect a continued relationship mm -hmm. that wasn't going to be there. So uh, you know, I know you addressed the issue of sustainability with, with Mary and all that, but how do you guys manage those expectations in the community in the beginning and that you're not just going in, doing a project, getting students to the end of the community? Very quick for me, it's become, I'm very, I'm very upfront about it, that they get the student for a semester and, that, and, 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 and talking through that. But secondly, I try to uh, communicate very clearly that even though you don't have a relationship with the students long term, you will have a relationship with me. The, the, like the faculty is really the link and that, you know, from semester to semester, we might have a tough student that didn't really do their job, but then, you know, we've had several students that were good and then they have, they have a trust with me to be like, we didn't really like this person or there was a challenge here. And they, they can trust that I will address it. So it's really about the, the faculty's investment in, in their work. And it really is, you know, it's the same with research, right? You don't go on there going, we're going to research you, thanks. See you later. <laughs> um, <laughs> some people do. Right. And so, but it's the same thing and you have to be like, you know, even if the students move on, I, I want to be part of the community, so I want to connect. Uh, things. That's what I've done. And I think one of the things we've seen is as we develop particular partners, they they do have that kind of semester-long limitation, but then other classes might get involved. So we have Mommy's TLC, Mentoring of Minorities and Education's Total Learning Systems. So we had our DC Reads program is tutoring them, and then we had um, was it your class or Gemma's class? Nancy's work. Oh, Nancy's work with them. So different communication courses might have created films for them or fundraising materials. Other people might do, uh, I believe, once. You did it. Yeah, yeah. Tell them what you did with them. Uh, we had business students uh, look at their social media strategy and try to um, get a, a social media strategy together so that they could uh, recruit donors. So their director knows she can always come back to AU and depending on her needs or her wish list, you know, get different kinds of support. So but, but it is, I mean, I'm not going to say it's not a challenge. I think you're raising a really important issue. But to balance that, my recommendation is, again, there's, there's a cohort building, so you want to build a relationship between AU and uh, the community. Like, you don't want to build a relationship between just you and the community or just the students in the community. But that, you know, there's, there's CSS and a lot of things. Yeah, I definitely, I'm definitely very clear that, you know, I can commit this many students for this long. And actually, uh, and if we have time, we can talk about this, but some students are remaining on, like oh. Sam, with the organization. So I, I think a good number, like, I can think of maybe yeah, five students from the so. 15 mm -hmm. are going to keep working with the nonprofit they're working with. So, but you can't promise that. <laughs> but it happens, and that's kind of like a nice, like, icing on the cake. But mm -hmm. what I do is I, I, I connect them with CSS, so they get in their database, and then it's like, oh, you, you know, and I connect them with other professors. Um, as much as I can. Well, maybe it's a good time for you to just give us a few words about your perspective. So it's good to hear what our students really say about this stuff. Yeah, so um, Social Construction Childhood was the first community-based learning class I took in the EU, and I definitely very much appreciate the experience. So like Professor Palmer said, I uh, worked at Safe Shores, which is the DC Children's Advocacy Center, and I think myself and all the other students there, um, I think the experience was went far beyond our expectations of what we got out of it and the, and the environment that was that we walked into. The staff was very supportive of us. I think it was a really great mutual relationship. And that's one of the reasons why I think myself and 
two of the four, mm -hmm. I mean, three out of the four students that were in safe shores are continuing on that semester. And then also three of us uh, <coughs> then took on kind of an additional part in their organization becoming facilitators for their uh, child sexual abuse prevention program. Mm -hmm. So I think, at least from a student perspective, um, uh, it's hard to generalize, but I think EU students are looking for ways to get involved mm -hmm. in DC. And that's why they come to DC to study. And I think a lot of students are service oriented, regardless of what school they're in. So I think it's a great time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, these three students applied for a grant to be able to get certified, to be certified trainers for Safe Shores. And now, like, are going to be bringing to AU and so you see it, Stewards of right. Children, yeah. is that it's called. Those are the three oh. students that are, like, certified right. trainers to do this sexual, child sexual abuse awareness training for, for other individuals. So what a testament to the impact of that course, both for the organization and then for youth, youth grade. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, are there any resources or, or limitations for transportation when you go out there? How do you handle that? Yeah, um, I'd actually like to speak to that. Um, I, um, I, got, I became concerned about that um, in my class. And because um, the Latino student fund, they can walk to. But I knew that wasn't the case for the other three sites. And so I ended up actually applying for a grant from, maybe I shouldn't tell everybody this, but from CTRL, the Teaching Enhancement Grant. And I was like, mm -hmm. I'm doing this great. I'm, I'm enhancing my teaching mm -hmm. by sending students out to the community. Right. And they gave me $100 to um, give uh, to students. And so I, I, I sent a note out to students and I said, you know, um, confidentially indicate to me if, if this would be helpful to you. And it, it worked out It worked out well. I was I gave, um, a couple students um, uh, metro cards that they could load onto their card and, and one student a gas card um, to help defray those costs. That's obviously not something that can be done every semester with every CD class, um, but I think it's something we should figure out. We've talked about this in other settings. That's not how necessarily to true. How to institu institutionalize it. How can we institutionalize it? Because students, it's a lot, it's a lot of it's burden on students. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, don't, don't assume that CTRL would not support all CDM okay. courses. In the past, um, actually just until I think last year, all faculty, if they applied, could get 75 or hundred dollars. And they said, well, not it was 75 a uh, um, semester, I believe. Um, then they said, well, we have this money, but nobody's really using it. So they moved it into hundred dollars for a simple application and five hundred dollars for more technological programs. Mm -hmm. so, so that's an option. Then. They, 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 they're still being, I know this for a fact because I applied and Naomi asked me if I would do a testimonial about, <laughs> about <laughs> how, how simple right. it is to get 500 bucks for <laughs> something that you need. So she needs applications. Another model that we've seen that's been pretty successful um, is that if you know that this that you're going to be sending your students out, you can actually add a lab fee to your course. Right. Um, and so say you add a $25 lab fee to your course, you buy $20, $25, I don't know, you use Correct. that towards a smart trip card for your students. That way the students that are like suffering financially, that can be part of their scholarship that they have mm -hmm. for the institution. And then for those Very students good. that can't afford it, it's part of it's part of that fee. And so that's another model that I've seen faculty use. But we do recognize it as a concern, so we're not letting it drop with these two approaches. We are pushing because DC is just costly to get around. It's time consuming and costly. And there, there are probably are other things we could come up with, but we don't have the funding right now. We had one student who took a carload of um, his, his team over the mines and I was just wondering about Theoretically, the, there should be a liability form the students sign that say that if something happens, they will not hold him, you know, yeah. responsible. That's what happens if I take students or if we put them. We have two. Our office has two vans, and if you had a student or you were certified to drive them, you could also take students there during the day. At the end of the day, they're used for DC Reads, so most of the time they're free during the day. There used to be a whole fleet of vans. AU is moving towards uh, that zip car zip thing, car. which is very expensive. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we should come up with some policies on if yeah. students are driving. Yes, thank you. Yeah. How do you uh, make it clear in the host organization's uh, mind that th this is something different than an internship? Mm -hmm. Or is it different? Like, what's that conversation about? 
iShares sees us as a website, and I said, this is what we're doing. See, they think this is what we're doing. Okay. So that it's very clear. So there's the reciprocity, there's the co-educators. So like, as a co-educator example, I brought some folks from my intermediate charter school to come in, show the documentary about early days of the school, and talk about why why education in the context of juvenile justice matter, you know, that kind of stuff. So like, this is our partnership for this semester, and, and I think that's maybe talking more about it as a part partnership in some way, instead of, but at the same time, I want students to put it on their resume, right? Mm -hmm. So like there's that tension, but I think it's about being like, we're doing it under this umbrella of community-based learning, and let me tell you a little bit about what that is. That's and I, I constantly get requests, we need interns, can you help us? So I say, well, at uh -huh. AU, interns are, internships are handled by the Career Center, and I send them the link, I say the good thing about internships is that you're gonna get more hours probably students will do 10 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So they can do that, but they can also do community-based learning if it's linked to a class. It's well, not, internship is more individual. It's, it's more than that, because mm -hmm. in the CB structure, the client is not the boss. Yes, okay. Yeah. We with the students are. And they so get it's a very different students. relationship. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have one, if I may, one okay. comment. I had trouble with, um, sometimes uh, students taking advantage of group work by not working. <laughs> um, and it's sometimes difficult to solve those problems when it comes to a final grade for a uh, project, especially when uh, a key individual fails to produce uh, a component that really uh, is necessary. So I've, I've worked out a, a simple system that says you're your grade is based on your, your at least by my assessment, your participation in the team, uh, your effort, and your execution. And each person defined what his or her job was so I could easily dis, uh, discriminate among grades. Right. But next time, next time I do this, um, and in fact, I'm going to do it at my graduate level that isn't CB, but it is teamwork for uh, film production. I'm going to use something from Kogod about um, uh, team team building and team contracts and pledges, mm -hmm. okay. so that uh, people are held directly more accountable mm -hmm. um, in terms of their responsibilities to themselves, the group, and the client. Great, that sounds like a great approach. Maybe yeah, I do a peer evaluation that's confidential, like yep. a Google form or whatever. Yeah. And then I actually, in my graduate class, I don't think I've done this in my undergraduate class, um, assign a grade associated it. So it's you know rarely, often, sometimes on different tasks, you get a one, two, or three. And that's part of your participation grade is, you know, or I think I had like a peer value or a group grade, I don't know, you know what I mean? Yeah. It does cause com problems, but you know, it, it's, a, it's a way to quantify it. And that's something like a tool like that, that we're, we are creating a, a common listserv for everybody involved in this. So I hope everybody, the, the sign in list has been passed around so we can write to you all and say, do you want to be part of the listserv? And those are the kinds of things that would be great to share. I think we have time for one more question because then I have a couple more slides. Ludi, oh, how about you two? Yeah. You want to go first? Okay. Um, so with each of your specific um, section, with yours had a very clear, we're creating visual art. Yours, you had a sustainable project. How did you ensure that when you sent kids to these places that they weren't, like I had some internship experiences where I stuffed a lot of stuff into envelopes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I put it on my resume, but how do you make sure that it, yeah. they're yeah. utilized yeah. well once yeah. they get there? Uh, can I speak to that? <laughs> sure, sure. She's I, great just, I, just, I just designed a, um, a CV, C levels precisely for an internship program which uh, our majors in Spanish have to take. So how do we make sure that students do not spend more than, let's say, 10 hours of clerical work? Because that's not, the, the point is not to do that. And one of the ways in which we ensure that is precisely the journals that they keep, which, in which they tell us exactly what they are doing per week. So very early on, we know exactly what they are doing. And if that happens, then we contact the supervisor because one of the, of the issues of CB uh, course designations is that our relationship with the, with the community partners has to be strong. I mean, it's just not that we send students there and we forget about them. Um, in the syllabus, there's specificity about the times or you know, like the weeks in which we're going to ask super faculty advisors to supervise student uh, progress, right? Uh, but the connection with the with the supervisors on site is fundamental, mm -hmm. you know, from our end. So that's to guarantee that they are not doing clerical work because that's 
not part of the reciprocity issue in which students are supposed to be going there to learn stuff uh, because somebody else can do it very well. Well, the good thing, one of the things you're mentioning is that there are different tools for reflection that are going to enhance the experience. Sometimes they're written like a journal. They could be discussion in class. A lot of times it is troubleshooting because you're always going to have one or two sites that are just not quite working out. And it might be it can be corrected with that communication. And it might be, you know what, let's flip you over and move you on to a new, a new site. And just because I, I try to have an extended relationship with the organization, the first time is the roughness because you don't tell you what you're going to get. But I've, I've actually, it's been really encouraging. So there's a couple of organizations that I feel a strong enough relationship with, but you know, afterwards we debrief, like what, 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 what did the student learn with you? What were the challenges? The fact that they come to student presentations, they get to hear that. And so I was very encouraged because one of my community partners actually emailed me first this time around and said, mm. at the presentation, I heard the students got, really got a lot just by coming to meetings. So I'm gonna invite them to more meetings tonight. I think this is what we're gonna do next year. They initiated and there was this evolution of what they were doing. Whereas the first time, they really just didn't like excel most of the time. And I had to try to catch up on that. But that has evolved a lot and it's been really encouraging. So relationships and communicating with the partners. Diego, can you flip ahead to the kind of final three slides? <coughs> Anybody else have a final question? Uh, comment around relationship with the community partner. Uh, I used to work in nonprofits, which I've mentioned, and there's a lot of turnover. Mm -hmm. So I think it's also good to try and have more than one connection in the nonprofit mm -hmm. if possible. Um, so that that when you know, if I teach something every fall, and then in July I'm like, hey, Jenny, and then it's like, Jenny no longer works here. Right. Um, right. And then yeah. the other thing I do is a site evaluation where the site supervisors send me evaluations of each of the yeah. students so that I can get kind of a pulse from their end and that things are going okay. Um, Okay, so I just wanted to kind of sum up. Uh, as I said, Meg and I are with the Center for Community Engagement Service. We are there to support you, to support the students. Constantly hearing from different nonprofits, so EngageNet is one, one good place to see what they're posting and what their needs are. Uh, we also are regionally and nationally um, representing the AU at various conferences, and we would love to get more of your students and you at, at some of these conferences, which I'll tell you about in a second. And then we're also trying to make sure that AU is giving greater recognition to this very laborious practice that we think is sends a great message to the city about social responsibility. It's definitely a high impact practice that you know keeps students in school, it contributes to retention, but AU on the kind of broader level needs to recognize and give people the time to do it, do it well. And sometimes that means smaller classes and course course reduction and things like that. Jane is not a good example of that because she's on course increase. No, I, I, now I'm on a course reduction. Okay. That's All right. Different. So that's us. That's it. That's it. And then the next slide will tell you a little bit about those directories and you can take some home if you would like if you think that's useful. And then the final slide are some events and some deadlines coming up. So how many people think uh, they will be using community-based learning in some form or another this current semester that begins on Monday. Okay, so if you're interested, you can come by our community partner fair. How many organizations will be at it, do you think? About 20 and talk to people directly all afternoon on the 21st. Or you can send your students directly and you can put this into your syllabus if you're still working on the floor. Um, if you're doing the add-on credit, uh, Meg or I can come into your class and talk about it. You can put it in your syllabus and that has a deadline of the 26th. So that's a pretty quick turnaround considering one Monday, Monday is a holiday. <laughs> February 6th, um, if you're interested particularly in community-based research, there will be an event, we don't have all the details yet, the two faculty in SIS are organizing an all-day event to share participatory action research. And then how many people think they might want to have a fall 2015 course BCB? One, two, Okay. Thinking about it. Three. Thinking about it. Okay. So um, we're happy to talk to you about that. The application is it up already? It's up. It's already up. But we can talk to you about what that means. We know you won't have your final syllabus ready for the fall. We know we'll collect it from you later. Just that you're committed to doing these eight things. And we're having a great conference. That's Maryland DC Campus Compact. I highly recommend you get on there their listserv because they have a great newsletter with lots of jobs and opportunities and on a Saturday we're having a, a regional conference here on our campus. Actually Meg Rigo is overseeing the curriculum and um, there's a call for proposals now so you can present at it or you can just attend it costs like ten dollars it's real cheap. 
And it's a great event. And the neat thing is you really hear what's going on from about 30 different campuses around the, around the area. And then finally, 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 if you uh, heard Naomi emphasize, Naomi Barron today, CTRL and our office are hosting our second annual faculty fellows, community-based learning faculty institute, okay? Kim did it last summer, so did Larry. So I hope you'll uh, talk to them if you're interested. Two days, totally free. A lot of hands-on tools, a lot of materials, food, and visits in the community. And we'd love to see more if you do that. You can work on revising a syllabus for some time next year. So um, with that, evaluation forms, please, as little squares. And just a couple minutes if you want to talk to anybody who's up here or anybody in the audience.